Good day, everybody. It's great to be back with you uh, this morning. Uh, we continue our conversations about uh, everything lodging and hospitality. Uh, lodging industry, as all uh, of us know, has been experiencing the worst performance in recent history, and hotels continue to be in the survival mode. With depleted cash reserves, Hotel owners are wondering how they're going to service their debt or, for that matter, uh, 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 make their payrolls. Under the current circumstances, the historical data doesn't necessarily help either in predicting the future. As we look at the long and winding road of recovery, uh, as the song goes, everyone is struggling to find the answers. What can the borrowers do to better prepare for the immediate future? How are lenders supporting the borrowers or working with them? And what different financial products might be available for the borrowers to work through their uh, financial challenges? I'm Abbott Bhatt, uh, glad to have you all with Hospitality Talks, and I'm here with my co-host, Sam Eric Rutman. Sam. Thank you, Abed. Uh, this is a very interesting times, as we always say, and uh, uh, we have all been, we have all been looking forward to uh, past. I understand now from as of May, everyone will have access to to the vaccination, and then for consequently, people are now be looking at well, how is that going to affect positively to people's plans to travel. Uh, in USA. So I'm very interested to hear what our experts have to say about everything that has been ha happening in terms of the various uh, efforts to stimulate the, the uh, to get the business back to uh, where it should be. So uh, if it's all right, Abit, we will bring the panel to the scene. Sounds like a plan, Sam. Uh, we uh, have a fabulous panel of professionals to discuss hotel performance and resulting a financial crisis. Uh, first and foremost, uh, John Freitag, who is the National Director for Hospitality Market Analysis with CoStar Group and Senior Vice President for Lodging Insights. He leads the hospitality market analysis team and eats, breeds, sleeps hotel stats. Uh, uh, and, and we see John uh, speaking about these things uh, quite often. We glad to have him with us. Secondly, Kevin Davis, who is Senior Managing Director for JLL Hotel and Hospitality Group. He heads the debt capital markets efforts for America's business, working with the loan sales and financing teams. And he works mostly with the institutional owners and institutional lenders. And last but certainly not least, the, a name that is very well known in the industry, Jonathan Fallick who is founder and CEO of JF Capital Advisors. Uh, JF Capital Advisors uh, focuses on hospitality business, including debt and equity placements, asset acquisitions, dispositions, and strategic capital market uh, advisory service. Gentlemen, uh, welcome to Hospitality Talks. Great to have you with us. Thank you. So the, to to get us started, uh, uh, Jean, if you don't mind, we'll we'll uh, bring you uh, up first to set the stage as to uh, where the industry is headed. And and I'll get to the last question first. When is it going to get better? <laughs> so thanks again for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. When's it going to get better? Arguably, if you're in Miami, it's already pretty good. So we learned from the White House yesterday that uh, the administration thinks there'll be basically enough uh, shots in, in everybody's arm, one or two, as it may be, by July or so, June or July, you know, and that then will give people confidence to go back out on the road and travel. We have always suggested that at the third quarter, you know, so maybe post Labor Day, we would see some group travel return. We certainly are expecting, you know, healthy leisure demand this summer. But that's all nice and well, but we still expect that the occupancy this year 
is still going to be just around 50% or so. So if you're asking me, when are we going to go back to 2019 levels? That's a very different question and a very different answer. We're proposing today that we will hit 2019 room rate, ADRs, by 2023, but we'll not hit 2019, uh, I apologize, we're not, let me strike that. We will hit demand levels for 2019 in 2023, but we'll not hit ADR levels for 2019 and 2025. So it's demand first, room rate second, which basically mirrors the other uh, upturns that we've lived through that we have good data for 2009, 2001, and 1991. So John, it, it, it industry typically uh, has relied on year over year increases and decreases and, and that's sort of our, our yardstick, if you would. Uh, certainly 2020 uh, is an anomaly that none of us hope to ever go through again. So what measurement tools are really appropriate as we planning for the future? Uh, uh, if you go to 2019, which was possibly one of the best years industry has seen, and everybody was talking about a downturn at that time. Well, we did see a downturn and it was a precipitous drop. Uh, we went from the highest to the lowest in a matter of a couple of days. What, uh, what measurements are appropriate in an environment like this? Yeah, if you're not getting Jonathan Fallick's uh, monthly roundup of the industry, I strongly suggest you should. His second paragraph has been for the last year Industrial research data will tell you very little other than that beginning in March 2020, occupancy began to plummet. I, of course, would say that very, very differently. And first of all, we're called FGR, not industrial research. But his point is, look, the backward-looking data is not as interesting as the forward-looking data. So how can we make sense of the data that we're seeing right now? I think there are a couple of different ways you could think about this. Number one, compare yourself to 2019. I'm not sure, I agree with you, that that's the best yardstick because 2019, indeed, it was not one of the best, it was the single best year the US hotel industry had ever recorded. Most number of rooms sold, highest ADR occupancy in ref bar. So maybe that is indeed what people compare themselves to. I know on, on the, when I listen to the Wall Street calls, that's what everybody's doing. Maybe compare yourself to 2018 or so. But that's a good way to do it. The other way that we are um, going to produce our data going forward, there is a lot of indexing. You know, so it's basically compare yourself today to 2019 or to 2018, but not look at the percent drop, but look at the index. You know, the index is 73% today when it comes to ADR compared to 2019. So it's maybe just, you know, uh, uh, framing it slightly differently, but it shows hope. It shows acceleration versus continued negative, negative, negative numbers. And then of course, forward looking it, you know, with large forward star, a long time ago, five years ago, you know, outside the United States, and that data has been very well received, you know, in Dubai, in, in Tokyo, in, in Berlin, and we're now finally getting it into the United States and uh, the test market in five markets, and we hope to roll this out very, very quickly across the United States. So forward-looking data is really, really insightful right now. So, uh, 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 Jean, do you currently have access to the top 25 MSAs in U.S. from uh, forward-looking data? And, and whatever data you have access to, uh, is it uh, uh, indicating an, uh, a substantial increase in demand today? No. Um, so we don't have it for the top 25 market. We have it for four markets in the U.S. plus Montreal. Um, the data is very much the same as it is in the UK, as it is in Germany. Asia PAC and um, Middle East Africa is slightly different. But what we're see the trends are basically the same. There's very limited forward looking activity. The booking window has been crushed. But it is possible that you see a lot of uptick on a Thursday for a Friday or on a Wednesday for a Saturday. So a lot of booking volume in a very, very short term booking window. And then there are some very, very large scale events towards the latter part of the year in Edinburgh, um, in, in London, um, in, I want to say in, in Dubai as well, that have seen very, very healthy book, bookings 
just because people are saying, look, by that point, I will have the shot and we will have figured out how we can travel again internationally. And so let me just make sure I have my room. Well, at least if uh, there is a slight indication of the demand increase, I think that gives the industry a definite hope because right now, a uh, majority of the hotels are either shut down or partially operating their room inventory, and, and it's pretty much, unfortunately, uh, doom and gloom. John, if you compare 2020 and our current circumstances, to the last downturn in the industry, which was a uh, global financial crisis, are there similarities in performance? I know public health is the single biggest issue today, mm -hmm. but during GFC, obviously the economies around the world were uh, terribly badly hurt. Are there any parallels? Are there any learnings from GFC that can be applied to the industry today? Let me just go back to your very first statement that a majority of rooms is closed. We don't see that. It is the, the, the rooms that are closed are getting a lot of attention. You know, New York City, the Times Square Hilton, um, the Novo Hotel, the uh, Merritt Boardman Park in Washington, D.C., they get a lot of the headlines. But the limited service properties, mid scale, upper mid scale economy, they're open and they have been open and they're doing, you know, a little bit better than the full service boxes. So I just want to make sure that we all understand, yes, there are closures, but they're disproportionately getting the, 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 the press, you know, versus the properties that are just, you know, functioning and, and have. The connection to 2008, the main difference is obviously in 2008, we didn't know how this would end. We didn't know if we had a banking system anymore at the end of it, right? Here we know exactly how this is going to end two shots in the arm, and it's over, right? If the majority of the global population will get vaccinated, you know, this is a health crisis we can manage very well, just like the, the, the annual flu shots maybe, you know, going forward. So I think in, in the U.S., the main difference is vaccinations will make this a, a, a much, much shorter duration. Now, the impact, you know, on the trough was much, much steeper. I think the lesson that we learned in 2008, with seem to have hold held in, in 2020, that in that environment, discounting doesn't matter. Because I'm a corporate traveler, and you tell me, hey, I can get you a great five-star room for $25 in LA. I'm like, I'm not allowed to travel. <laughs> you know, like I can't go. So I think what we've seen in 2008 is that the, the, the discounting at the early phase is not necessarily induced demand. I think we're seeing that exactly now. As well, yes, room rates were down last year by around 20% or so, but that has not a lot to do with actual discounting and more a lot to do with mixture, right? Because the higher rated groups and tra corporate transient travelers weren't on the road as much as the leisure travelers. So we expect that the high-end companies that stick to their knitting and they're saying, look, our room is worth X, you know, will have a much easier time getting back to, to room rates that, that makes them sustainable. So if I heard you correctly, industry has finally learned that discounting the rooms doesn't necessarily create the demand? Unfortunately, <laughs> we learned it. Unfortunately, I'm not able to say yes yet. Ask me in 2022 about what happened at the end of 2021, because I think that there are two types of, of, of revenue management behavior. The first one is, there is no demand, and it doesn't matter what I do to my rate, so I might as well just leave. And the second part is, okay, now there is demand, and my owners are making me or wanting me to fill up a lot of room, then what happens? You know, and that's the second part starting in maybe August or so, or post-Labor Day. And I hope we've learned that <laughs> but we will report if we did or didn't. <laughs> Uh, one one more question, John, and I'll turn it over to Sam uh, so that uh, he can ask you the questions. But you talked about the rate. Obviously, rate would lag uh, as the demand grows. The uh, uh, rate will come in after the fact. But a lot of the markets in U.S., uh, particularly some of the major metros, the rate had not kept up, uh, particularly if you looked at the 
inflation adjusted rate uh, rate was lagging throughout if you put that into the equation and now there is a lot of conversation uh, with the feds that the way they're behaving it whether the inflation would kick in what type of uh, role would that play if you put inflation into the mix so in 2019 which we said you know the best year ever you know, most rooms sold highest occupancy, you know, 66.3%. ADR growth was 1%, which if you take out inflation, you probably were basically flat or, or negative. Um, and that's concerning, right? Because if if we can't, if we don't have pricing power, when we sell the most rooms ever, you know, Econ 101 would dictate our room rates should have grown a little further. If we don't have pricing power, then will we ever have pricing power again? Now. You know, the advent of the OTAs that are firmly entrenched, you know, some would point at Airbnb. I'm, I'm not a big fan of that logic chain, but I, I know Jonathan and I may, may have some interesting conversation about that. You know, um, there, there, it, there are some outside forces that make it very, very, very hard, you know, for room rates to continue to drive. I had this conversation in 2019 with a professor from the Cornell Hotel School, Jack Cordell, who said, Jan, Maybe we have it, maybe, you know, maybe we have it all wrong. Yeah, maybe you have it all wrong. Maybe this isn't about maximizing rate growth. Maybe this is about maximizing occupancy. And then a lot of other things follow, right? And we're just all chasing the room rate growth that is so elusive. Owners do what's best for the owners. And if they maximize occupancy, maybe we're asking the wrong question. I, that always stuck with me. I thought that was a very interesting angle. You know, maybe we're not looking at this the right way. And maybe the high occupancy, especially for the full service properties that have a lot of F and B and spa and golf and what have you, you know, maybe for those properties that is indeed correct. You know, it's it's uh, uh, funny because the, uh, as we all have known and talked about that you can't take rate to the bank, but RevPAR, which obviously your organization was big in creating some years ago is possibly a better measure. But I find it very interesting in our industry that we consider 66% annualized industry-wide occupancy as our high watermark. I'm not sure if any other industry, if you took offices as an asset class uh, uh, or airlines, even though airlines are, are not the best comparison, but I wonder if there is any other asset class that can operate at at those levels of occupancy, and and uh, have uh, that as a high watermark. A any any thoughts on that? I mean, so we're not part of Coaster, so I have access to you know unlimited other real estate data, and so I look. And what's interesting, just sort of fascinating, is just in terms of how we talk about it, nobody talks about occupancy. Everybody talks about vacancy. The vacancy rate is three percent. 5%, very, very low number. And then we come in here and we're like, look, you know, we're 66% full. So the vacancy would be in the 30% range, which is just so depressing. So we don't talk about that. We talk about the offer. Um, you're exactly right. I think we're the only ones, but of course we, our leases only last one night, you know? And I think that's the main difference to an office to, to, uh, to reach out to multifamily, you know? And I think if, because you can reprice each night and our customers choose us each night, they choose us on certain nights, they don't choose, you know, Sunday night, for example, who wants to travel on a Sunday night, you know? And so uh, at 66 is, is the best number there is, yeah, but compared to other asset types, it's not very good. Well, you know, this this uh, uh, nightly leases, it's a, a, a double-edged sword because when we are experiencing a downturn, it, it hits us hard. On the upside, it, it, we capitalize on it, so it works both ways. Let me let me turn it over to Sam, and I'll be back with you in a moment. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm, I'm interested. I'm following out of Helsinki. I'm looking uh, through a long distance lens of what's happening in the U.S., and I'm quite fascinated about the different disruptors or uh, startup brands that have been coming for the last couple of years. Some of them are claiming that they look like an enterprise of SaaS business and uh, and the technologies, the core component, etc. So, I must, could you share maybe your observations on how you see that the, the, the brands that have been coming for, uh, on board now for the last couple of years, what possibly are they doing differently to be competitive in, in when we're coming into the upswing of, of the market? 
Well, I think if you start today, you have access to the best technology, right? You, your, your technology stack is just so much more scalable. You would never, ever have your own servers these days, right? Thanks to Amazon Cloud, Amazon Web Service, why would you ever possibly own any hardware again, ever, right? And you don't need your technology stack. You can outsource that as well to the Philippines, to India, what have you, you know? So I think your cross structure can scale just much, much faster or, or can come down, you know, if your customer demand isn't there. I think that's one, uh, that, that's one maybe main, one component on, on the cost side. You know, I think on the revenue, on the demand side, I think we're just able to slice and dice consumers in such smaller cohort, you know, and say, I want to target you, I want to target you, I want to target you. And that, you know, yields some, uh, uh, some results for, for some companies. You know, I do think overall, in the long run, the larger hotel companies with their large loyalty programs, you know, still have a little bit of a leg up for the corporate transient traveler and for the corporate group traveler, just because there's so many different price points, right? I stay, you know, 100, not 100, but 30 nights, 100 nights a year in a limited service hotel so I can get my points and then take my family to that luxury property and pay for it with my points. I think that has still has a certain appeal. It'll be interesting to see, you know, how the millennial Gen Z, Gen uh, Gen Y generation goes through that. It was always the fear that they wouldn't be as brand loyal, but the sweet siren song of points is <laughs> very hard <laughs> to get away from, especially if you're looking on a corporate travel system and the corporate travel system says, "Hey, here are the four hotels you can stay in," and guess what? They're all branded, so pick your brand. Very easy to sign up for the loyalty program and then participate in that which well they call it loyalty for a reason they build loyalty yeah now, I'm interested now also that there are certain uh, brands that have been, uh, they talk about uh, reinventing the high touch and locally uh, rooted hotels and uh, uh, creating luxury bunk bed rooms and etc. Is that specifically for sort of a particular market segment or do you think that's something that is uh, here to stay in, in, in the US for instance? High touch is going to be very tricky, right? Because touch today is... Ugh. Icky, you know, like you don't want to touch. So, high tech, you know, in combination with high touch when I want it, you know, is is a very, very uh, is a winning combination. And I think we will see that on the upper end of the market. My wife and I just took a, a, a staycation here in Nashville, and it was a it was a luxury hotel. I paid with my Bonvoy points, and the, I I walked into the room, and there was a QR code on the TV, and it said, "Hey, you want to use your phone as your TV remote." And it worked seamlessly. And I was like, oh, I read about that technology. I didn't know it would work, but it did. So that, you know, is very, very high tech. And I don't have to, you know, worry about, you know, touching a remote. So going away from the, from the touch part. So I think on the very high end, you know, we will see that bifurcation. But I think technology allows us also down the food chain, you know, for mid-scale, uh, upper mid-scale economy type properties who have less and less and less customer interaction sometimes because people just don't want it you know i literally am going to the front desk just to get my key can you just get it to me on my phone you know if you solve the security issues obviously but you know why why do i have to talk to a person let me just check it you know if i've been on a plane for 12 hours you know just get me to my bed my shower and my bed so i think technology will will certainly help how about digital currencies you know, yeah you did oh. Uh, how about digital currencies? There's a lot of buzz about uh, uh, Bitcoin uh, and, yeah. and so on. And I, there's a hotel in, in uh, Zurich who is, uh, they claim to fame is that they are accept a very traditional 150-year hotel that accept uh, uh, cryptocurrencies as payment. But the, the, the trick is that they have a hedge of 45 minutes. They can convert it to, to Swiss francs or euros. Uh, as, as, and that's just basically to create the awareness within the uh, high-tech companies close by the hotels, and that's how they're capturing an, an audience. But do you see any, any take in, in U.S. of hotels that are going to start to use uh, the, the, the Bitcoin or, or digital currency as, as part of their payments or accepting as part of payments? I, mean, I think the way Bitcoin is working, why would I ever want to part with it? You know, <laughs> I think once it has sort of the oscillations have stopped and it's a little bit more, look, it's $70,000 per $100,000, whatever the number ends up being, and there's not this huge run up, 
then I could think about, I could see us thinking about it. But right now, if I own it, it's like the guy who paid for, for, paid for his pizza, right? With like Bitcoin, whatever, 20 years ago or so. And he basically paid like $200,000 for the pizza. <laughs> you know, I think we don't, the consumers don't want to be caught on that side, you know, of the trade. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's a gimmick. Um, you know, I think there are obviously huge issues about what is technology infrastructure that needs to be in place for me to actually accept it, you know, and do I as a consumer, have my, where do I have my digital wallet and all that stuff? That all can be solved. I think right now it's just too early just because the run up is just so, so strong. Yeah, I mean, I, I also agree with you. I mean, I believe that uh, uh, the, the digital currency is one thing, but what's more interesting is the block the blockchain eventually and how that is going to be played with the smart contracts and also all that stuff. So, yeah. Well, that's all I have for you, uh, John. So over to you, Abit. Thank you, Sam. Uh, John, you briefly talked about the current inventory in some of the markets. Uh, it, 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 can you spend a few more minutes uh, about the supply side of things uh, by the way let's let's go back to the current inventory generally speaking how much of the hotels uh, have permanently boarded up whether it's functionally obsolete inventory because as a wise person once had said that the hotel industry is way under demolished we just keep repackaging it and, and uh, keep using it so how much of the inventory is completely boarded up and how much of the new supply might be coming on the market? Uh, and then we'll bring our next guest in after this. I think this was attributed to uh, John Q. Hammond, the, uh, the famous hotel guy. He said that we are you know, not overbuilt, but under demolished. Um, today, January, which is the latest data, 3.3% of rooms in the United States are temporarily closed now you're asking me which one of those are permanently closed and i don't know yet you know that obviously is a work in progress because the owners hold on hold on hold on until it doesn't work anymore yes there are a, a, a rooms around times square so that that are permanently closed but even there and and i wonder if jonathan um has a slightly different perspective on this i like to think that these hotels are permanently closed until they're not Right until somebody steps in and says, "Hey, if I could get in at fifty cents on the dollar, you know, maybe this does make sense. Maybe I don't make it a full service hotel. Maybe I make it a limited service hotel." So, I'm, the, the permanent close question is still something that looms very large. Talking about what's in the pipeline today, the pipeline peaked in April of last year, two hundred sixteen thousand rooms, the highest room in the highest number of rooms in construction we've ever recorded ever has since declined to 196,000 rooms in January. We fully expect that number to continue to decelerate and to decrease because the rooms that are being built right now will continue to open, but projects that are in you know, final planning for entrepreneurs purposes, where you've talked to the brand, you may have talked to a lender, you may have talked to an architect, you know, you may say, let me just hold off for one minute. You know, let me just take a breath and start it a year from now or so. So the number of rooms in construction we expect to further decelerate, that's exactly what happened in 2007 and 8. In 2007, the pipeline peaked at 200,000 rooms. And then in 2011, so three and a half years later, was at 50,000 rooms. We don't expect that the, the divot, the, the drop this time is that steep, but there will be some impact. Terrific. Well, thank you for all that, John. Please stay with us. We'll have you back in a moment. At this particular point, I'd like to bring up uh, Kevin Davis. Uh, Kevin, thanks for being with us. My, my pleasure. Appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak. Absolutely. It, you know, I'm, I'm going to pose the question that Sam Eric had brought up about paying the, the guest room uh, charges with the uh, cryptocurrencies. Talk about blockchain and will that uh, uh, democratize real estate ownership? And is that a possibility for real estate moving forward? Yeah, look, I, I, I certainly think it's a possibility longer term. Uh, we, we've not yet seen it affecting the industry in the US. Um, so I think it's something that we'll, we'll certainly 
uh, stay abreast of. But at this point, there's been there's been no real effect. So it, it, again, it's I think it's a trend that we'll monitor and potentially we'll see uh, at some point in the future, but but not yet. Not today. Fair enough. Not uh, today. Well, tell us a little bit about the types of situations you were involved in, the the cash flow issues and and. Uh, um, how are the institutional investors dealing with this precipitous drop? How are they recapitalizing? And, and what sort of conversations are you having with your clients on, on owner side, but also with the lenders that are uh, willing to at least participate in these uh, recapitalization efforts? So, so it's really interesting. Um, there, there's a bit of a dichotomy which is taking place. I really compare it to um, uh, the dichotomy between Wall Street and Main Street. Ma Main Street is at the operating levels at the property where you've had a precipitous drop in performance um, relative to everything that Jan discussed previously, occupancy down, ADR down, et cetera. And we're looking at a years long recovery. So if you speak with an asset manager, uh, they will talk to you about how bad things are on the ground. Interestingly, and in contrast, from a capital markets perspective, i.e. Wall Street, uh, there's arguably never been a time where there's been as much capital on the sidelines looking for opportunity um, and, and anxious to be deployed as what we're seeing now. And so while the property fundamentals continue to be challenged, um, there's a real demand for investors to buy hotel assets. Um, we were talking last year about a discount for acquisitions on the order of 25 to 30 plus percent uh, discount to pre-COVID valuations. Um, the discounts that we're talking about today are significantly less than that. I would argue we're probably talking 10 to 15 percent generically. And for certain higher quality assets, the discounts may be zero to 5%. Um, so just this interesting dichotomy that's that's the merge between performance at the property relative to, uh, relative to the capital markets. Uh, in response to your question about lenders, um, so we, we've, we've seen this dynamic where because of the magnitude of the problem, I don't think any, any lender that underwrote a hotel loan assume that it was possible that one or two or several of their loans, a small percentage of their portfolio would be challenged at any given time. They didn't expect that their entire hospitality book would be challenged at the same time. Um, so because of the magnitude of the problem, lenders are focused on working with their borrowers to work through challenges as opposed to exercising rights and remedies uh, and taking the keys. So I would say the lenders have taken a fairly conciliatory approach with borrowers. Um, look, hotels are an operating asset. And so let lenders get paid to deploy capital, get paid a fair rate of return and get their money back at par at uh, maturity of the loan. Most are not interested in incurring operating liabilities, operating losses at a property level and or supporting a hotel. So as a result, they're working with their borrowers. And in many cases, we're seeing borrowers and lenders come to some reasonable conclusion uh, where borrowers are frequently either putting in additional capital into reserves, potentially paying down loans, uh, in some cases, bringing in third party partners. Uh, lenders are also willing to extend the terms of loans. Uh, they're willing to waive covenants. Uh, in some cases, we're even seeing lenders, very rare cases, but some cases seeing lenders even contributing capital to deals. So I would say it's it, there's been a fairly cooperative dynamic between lenders and borrowers in working through a number of the challenges that the industry is facing. So a, a couple of things uh, to, from your your comments. Uh, uh, first of all, the the discount uh, expectation in in asset trades, if you would, that hasn't really transpired, and by all accounts. It seems like for for really good assets, it might never come to pass. Are there any similarities between uh, um, discounting today or expectation of discounting today uh, compared to uh, GFC time period? Were 
assets trading at much bigger discounts where people are having to take much bigger haircuts at that time? Yeah, so again, I, I would say that, look, because this crisis feels a bit easier to underwrite because to Jan's earlier point, two shots in the arm, herd immunity, people will be back out, they'll be traveling. Um, certainly, we don't expect that things will return to 2019 numbers overnight but it certainly feels much more quantifiable. So from an underwriting, the way I think about it is, it almost feels like the capital markets are underwriting the crisis like a, like, like a non-recurring event, an accounting uh, convention that you see. Um, it's 2019, 2021, sort of one-time event. It is what it is. Let's assume that that's not the normal and we'll assume that the normal will resume at some point in the future. And so it's it's really interesting that people are effectively looking past what's happened with COVID, not dissimilar to what you're seeing in equity market, the broader public market valuations where um, where where the equity markets have have run pretty aggressively. So look, I would say that there 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 are discounts. Um, there are certainly some assets where again the discounts are not as great. There, there's some assets where but for COVID they would never have traded. And so for those higher quality assets, you're seeing buyers willing to pay up uh, to get access to an opportunity that they otherwise may not have gotten. Um, the other thing I would say is, I suspect that this will play out over a number of years. I mean, right now we have 20 plus billion dollars of CMBS hotel loans that are in special servicing. The process of going into special servicing workouts, uh, potential foreclosures, REO sales, loan sales. This stuff just takes a really long time. And CMBS lenders are at the very beginning of dealing with some of the issues. So we expect that you'll see that play out over a number of years um, in some markets, particularly where there's more distress um, and among certain asset types you may see a drag on pricing because there may be an overhang of assets that um, distressed assets that sell over time. So look, it's it's hard to say where we'll end up from a valuation perspective today relative to relative to um, to the to the great financial crisis. But um, but look, the you know, the final chapter certainly hasn't been written on this story. And uh, th this is one that will will play out over several years. So it, uh, uh... Uh, talk a little bit about the the debt markets. Uh, it, it, is debt readily available? As as uh, one of the conversations, uh, somebody had told me, "Hey, look, uh, uh, hotels have become a four letter word." So uh, I I don't want to I don't want to talk about debt if it's a hotel asset. I would tend to think that the yields that are being required from hotel loans are far better than uh, what you might get out of multifamily or office or industrial type of asset class. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, what is the availability of debt? What kind of uh, 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 covenants can I be expecting if I was to find some debt? So I'll qualify my answer a bit because I spend most of my time in the institutional space, generally in primary or secondary markets with higher quality assets as a general matter, not, not all trophy, not all luxury, but generally higher quality institutional assets. And I would tell you among those types of assets, we've seen a tremendously strong resurgence in um, debt availability, um, much more liquidity. Uh, we actually on several, uh, in several cases have lenders um, chasing very aggressively to finance hotel assets. So we've seen the debt markets come back. Um, one caveat is that there is, um, there is definitely a, uh, there's differentiation that's occurring where you're seeing some of the highest quality assets being chased aggressively with pricing to match. And what does that look like? It spreads in the LIBOR plus high 300s to LIBOR plus 400s, maybe low 500s for the higher quality assets. Um, but then also for good assets that may be lesser quality, you could see lenders chasing that in the LIBOR plus 650, 750 and higher. 
So there, there is a pretty big disparity and it's not uncommon for us when we run a campaign, uh, as we get in bids, we may have 100 to 150 basis point spread disparity between the best lender, the lowest spread and the highest spread. So, so the market's making distinctions, but as a general matter for relatively high quality institutional assets, um, there, there is certainly uh, quite a bit more liquidity today than there was six months ago. Um, and it's certainly possible to get those types of assets financed. Oh, fabulous. One last question before I turn it over to Sam. You, you talked about distress. Uh, uh, are you starting to see that surface? And what kinds of markets is distress uh, more prevalent? And what kind of assets it might be? Most of the institutional uh, owners have been able to raise quite a bit of capital, uh, uh, as I understand it to be. But uh, what are you seeing? Yeah, so, you know, it's an interesting question. The, the distress is, is very situational right now. I tell you that as a general matter, we've not seen a lot of forced selling, i.e. The, the sponsor or the lender just have to get out and they're willing to accept whatever a market clearing price is, which is one of the reasons why we haven't seen the level of discounting that many thought there would be uh, in the early days of the crisis. So not a lot of forced sales. Um, so where you're selectively seeing distress, uh, there's also a floor being provided by just the amount of capital that's out there. Um, so there, there have been a number of uh, PREF equity, rescue equity deals that have come to market. Some have been publicly marketed by uh, JLL and some of our competitors where others have been privately placed, so direct deals. And what we're seeing there is there's there's a strong bid um, and the pricing, particularly for PREF equity and rescue equity is somewhere between, call it, you know, 14 and 18 percent all in. Uh, there's a deep pool of capital that's available um, to take advantage of those situations. Uh, and then in some of the more challenging situations where perhaps there may not be an equity bid, what will frequently happen is you may go to market, you may look for equity, um, you may not raise it, at which point um, that precipitates a conversation with your existing lender. Um, and the lenders frequently forced with it uh, to answer a tough question, which is, do you exercise your rights and you step into the shoes of the owner and now you're on the hook for the liability or do you work with the owner to try to figure it out even if the owner may not have a lot of equity to invest and again even in those extremely distressed situations you're seeing lenders and owners figure out a way to work together such that there's not a fire sale of the asset i i guess in many ways the banks and the lenders are not necessarily in the arbitrage business because I, I, even if they were to foreclose it, they are foreclosing the next year it'll be better and because they now hold the keys they can overnight improve the performance which uh is not going to be a possibility at least in the immediate terms uh let me turn it over to sam and i'll be back with you in a moment yes uh, kevin i have uh, the following question uh, i'm reading about uh, the aggressive stimulus pack policies uh, that is uh, going in place and and also has started to surf surface in the st U.S. stock market and possibly then uh, pushing the asset valuation above levels justified. Could you share your observation and thoughts at what impact all this may have? Uh, we're looking at the asset valuations. Yeah, absolutely. So what, what the government stimulus, it, it, it will help in a number of ways. First, directly through the PPP program, uh, owners, managers, get access to capital, uh, which helps them meet some of their operating costs. So to the extent that their distress and or cash flow issues, um, the direct subsidies being provided by the government helps alleviate that. So what we've seen, and this happened a lot when the CARES Act passed originally, is that uh, it forestalled um, some of the tougher conversations because owners now had the liquidity to deal with, with a number of issues. So that's that's on on the one hand. On the second hand, because the government will be injecting a significant amount of capital into the economy, and literally putting money in the pockets of consumers, uh, there will be uh, money going to municipalities, cities, and states. That will have a multiplier effect, a stimulative 
effect where people will have more money and the thought is that they'll go out and spend it. Uh, I have to think that that will lead to more travel, um, which as a result, there's just going to be greater demand for hotel products. So I, I think it helps one from an operational perspective at the property because you're giving owners liquidity. And then two, I think it also helps on the demand side of the equation as well as, as the stimulus makes its way through the economy. Good. Thank you. So oh, back to you, Abbott. Well, it, 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 Kevin, talk a little bit about foreign capital. Uh, typically in a downturn, uh, well, U.S. has always been a safe haven. Uh, people like the real estate sector. People like uh, lodging assets. Talk about the foreign capital. It, it, is there an influx of capital coming in? Is there a potential for that to happen? What have you seen? Yes, absolutely. So we, we've certainly seen uh, selective foreign interest in hospitality, uh, particularly uh, from European investors and more specifically in the UK. Uh, we've seen a number of uh, high net worth uh, families investing from the UK and from Europe investing in the US. Um, so, so that's certainly a trend that, um, that we're seeing play out. Uh, we're also seeing um, some Middle Eastern investors kicking the tires um, as well, less active than some of the European investors, but we're, we're seeing that. Um, I would say um, Asian investors less so, uh, I think taking more of a wait and see approach. Um, you know, it's interesting, uh, Korean investors, which have been very active in the lending space uh, in the U.S., um, particularly Mez, Mezdet, uh, a number of the assets that they made loans on uh, are having operational issues like many hotel assets are. Um, and they typically made loans against large full service assets, many which are urban, uh, which have been challenged. Um, so we've, we've seen some of those investors being forced to either sell their loans and or reinvest capital. Uh, and we've seen selectively the, a willingness on the part of some of those investors to potentially reinvest in, uh, in, in those assets. But again, that tends to be more defensive rather than offensive. Well, terrific. Uh, Kevin, thank you for your insights. Please stay with us. We'll, we'll have you back in a moment. But at this particular point, I'd like to bring up Jonathan Fallick. Jonathan, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Well, Jonathan, you deal with uh, all different sponsors and all different lenders. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the strategic financing options that might be available to hotel owners today that, that you have seen some success relative to working through this uh, financial crisis. So, you know, it's very difficult to follow my two co-panelists. Uh, there, there are many things they said that are that are spot on and many I'd love to add on to. Uh, there's, I feel free there's to negate them if you like. <laughs> uh, have, we do it often. We do it often on camera <laughs> and off and off camera. But uh, there's there's basically kind of two different types of situations that we're generally dealing with. One is where the existing owner, sponsor, borrower has very little capital to invest, very little fresh equity to put in to right size the ship, deal with operating expenses, deal with the lender. And then there are others where there, there is the ability to infuse capital, uh, to fund reserves, uh, to do some debt pay downs. And where the borrower has the ability to put capital in, We've seen uh, a lot of lender appetite for loan modifications and restructuring. We've also seen with a borrower who's able to put money in, they've also been in some cases able to successfully partner with a new preferred equity investor. So they'll put in a few million dollars, you know, two, three, four million dollars, have a preferred equity investor partner with them and fund another 10, 15, 20 million dollars to right size the ship. And that's getting a lot of traction. The, the problem situations are where a borrower says, I either have the money, but will not invest another dollar because I need massive lender concessions, or I don't have the money. 
You know, I have five other hotels and three retail retail assets, a few malls, and nothing is performing well. I don't have it. You know, I'm happy to hand you the keys. I'm happy to fight with you. I'm happy to do a number of different things. So we, we're finding that where the borrower can't or won't put in some more capital and reinvest, uh, reinvest in their asset and uh, help give the lender some comfort, those are just struggling. They're 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 struggling. Their term sheets trading back and forth. Their you know tense conference calls. Uh, the ones that have traction are where there is some new capital coming in and a thoughtful plan uh, to get a lender repaid in the future. So it, 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 um, if really my stance as, a, as an owner is I don't want to put in a dime, I don't have it, uh, uh, have you seen uh, keys being turned over and have the lenders started taking that on? I know forbearance has helped uh, a lot of uh, these cases and we might have just kicked the can down the street, but are you seeing some of that uh, come uh, uh, to bear at this particular point? So it's still very early in the process, right? And we all get excited about deals and activity and transactions. If you look back through past cycles, you know, um, almost nothing from an asset transaction perspective happened quickly, right? So back in 2009, in late 2008 and 2009, you saw a lot of loans trade. And that was because the, the banking regulators forced commercial banks to get loans, bad loans or impaired loans off their books. Uh, there was a lot of repo lending that forced a lot of lenders to basically uh, sell in order to generate some liquidity just based on the way they finance their businesses. But if you really look at the hotel asset sales market, right, which um, if you ignore 2007, which was dominated by a lot of corporate LBO transactions, the market peaked in 2006 with the number of asset sales, individual asset sales, the sales volume and the price per key. And it took until 2015 to get back to the 2006 volume because loans traded, things traded on a more choppy basis. Uh, but you know, for a few years after 2008, there was not a, a normal functioning asset sales market uh, same thing after to, after 9-11, right? In 2002 and 2003, there was not a normal functioning sales market. Everything had something of a story. Uh, and by 2004 or five, the market started to come roaring back. Same thing in, in 2012 and 13, the debt market started to pick up again and open again. Uh, and even the construction finance market started to open in 2013, 14, uh, you know, and wide open in, in 14, 15. So it takes time. It just takes time. And we're, we're also excited about, you know, we've got all this liquidity. We're waiting. We're, we've got the truck ready. We backed up the truck. We're ready for the loans. We're ready for the assets. And, you know, to Kevin's point earlier, there's so much liquidity on the sidelines uh, that the, the likelihood that someone picks up something at a huge discount is highly unlikely uh, because most things will be either uh, fully marketed or softly marketed, but we'll have enough bids, enough data points, uh, you know, and enough motivated buyers, right, who are looking for good quality assets where they can get some yield. Jonathan, this this point about uh, uh, cash sitting on the sidelines, I guess this was even being talked about pre-COVID days. Uh, because the industry was performing at an absolute peak. So people waited because we were all talking about the downturn, the downturn, the downturn. And in some ways, it's unfortunately is a self-fulfilling prophecy other than when you put public health issue into the, the thing. But we never really saw the transaction volume pick up to the ex extent that people were looking for. Do you see that coming uh, towards the end of the year, beginning of the year? What are your thoughts? So I, I think what will happen is is sort of a multi-year resolution, right? And again, Kevin mentioned before PPP loans, the first round and the second round were helpful. 
one of the game changers was in uh, November, right? So throughout 2020, no one knew how to underwrite with any level of certainty. Uh, things were mostly a guess. Will we get back? When will we get back? Will we have a vaccine in a year or two years? And in early November, Pfizer made their announcement. And then later in the month, Moderna made their announcement. And what that did is it took away the worst case underwriting scenario. The, we may never have an effective vaccine or it may take five years. And it allowed both equity investors, lenders, capital markets, participants in the hospitality space to narrow their underwriting focus and say, OK, we'll come back to 2019. Why, why 2019? Because you know, it's it's the easiest metric to point to on a on a pre COVID pre pandemic basis. Uh, it doesn't mean that's the gold standard. But when do you get back to sort of a stabilized sort of sense of normalcy? And they started to look at that and say, is that one year, two years, four years, three years? So it's no longer this unknown where you have to attribute such a high discount rate and such a high kind of risk premium on your underwriting investment, you can say, oh, a boutique hotel in a good performing market with 130, 150 rooms, you know, could be back in 22. You know, a big urban uh, meetings hotel with 800 rooms, 1,000 rooms and 75,000 square feet of meeting space, that might take longer for the convention business to build back up and they have too many rooms for just business transient and leisure transient. So, you know, so what, one of the things that, that we're expecting will happen, and uh, not that we have a crystal ball, but what we've seen in prior, uh, in prior cycles is some people will hold on. Some people have achieved some forbearance, uh, success in forbearance or loan modifications. Uh, but when you fast forward a year or two and they have a loan maturity and the NOI hasn't fully recovered and there are CapEx needs at the hotel, that gets you to reevaluate pricing, available debt financing, and you'll start to see some assets sell, some portfolios sell, even some loans uh, get sold when people really have to think about, okay, we're back to, we're, maybe we're not back to 2019, maybe we're 80% back, but we have the right trajectory. And with that, what is their valuation like? What does their LTV look like? And I'll give a simple, I'll give a simple, hopefully round number example, right? If someone had an asset worth $100, you know, let's call it $100 million, or but $100, and they did a 65% you know, loan on a pre-COVID basis, they did it in 2018 at 5% interest. Well, if you assume now that the valuation is somewhat impaired, call it a 10% discount, that means the value has gone from 100 to 90. And let's assume also that that borrower was successful in getting a forbearance and a deferral of interest expense for a year, nothing else. So that's three and a quarter percent of incremental, uh, $3.25 million of incremental interest expense, right? Which got deferred and added to the principal balance. So now you have a $68.25 million debt balance on a $90 million valuation which is no longer 65%, it's now 78%. So now you have a 78% loan and, you know, is a new lender going to be okay underwriting, right, and advancing new proceeds to a 78% LTV, or I'm sorry, 76%, not 78. Sorry, my, my CPA days are far behind. Me. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things will, and the other thing that we've seen through each cycle, and this is really, really important, is you know the brands have been very accommodating in terms of brand standard relaxation, in terms of deferring PIPs, relaxing requirements, being okay where the lenders were okay with rating FF&E reserve accounts and CapEx replacement reserves. That that's going to change, right? In two years, if you know if if we're right, you know if STR uh, is right. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and others are right. And in two, three years, we're, we're kind of back. Uh, the Marriott's, the Hilton's, the IHG's, of course, Wyndham's of the world are going to be back in front of owners saying, hey, we're doing our quality assurance inspection and you're failing on this and this. We're, we're looking at our guest satisfaction scores. We had a PIP scheduled for 2021 
you know, we, we understand 2021, now it's 2023 or 2024, where's the money for it? And that need to strike a, stro stroke a big check for CapEx, right? Or to fund a shortfall on your refinancing, what you can refinance to is gonna cause additional transaction activity. So that's not a 20, that's for the most part, it's not a 2021 event. It's gonna keep people like my friend, Kevin Davis, very busy on the debt financing side uh, you know, for, you know, for three to four years after we think that the health crisis is behind us. So, it, it, Jonathan, as as owners and sponsors are trying to work through these issues, you brought up the FF&E reserves uh, that that uh, um, brands have been uh, pretty conciliatory in, in they working with the owners to make sure that we can continue to work through this downturn. If I find another equity partner or another that my current loan docs and covenants in the loan docs might trigger a whole host of other things that I might or might not even be aware of. Uh, what are some of those those pitfalls that I've got to be careful on? Uh, you know, a lot of the hotels have done long term leases on their function spaces as office space or rooms as office space uses or gone to the the first responders and, and done long-term leases on that. Has that created an issue? Certainly gave us some revenue, but has that created some issues in some of these cases? It's 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 very situation specific. It's a it's an excellent question. Uh, in fact, just the the idea of do you shut the hotel down, right? Or do you go to minimal staffing? can trigger, you know, can trigger a default of one of your operating covenants to continuously operate the hotel and operate it in a first class manner. Have lenders been uh, very difficult in it, you know, and, and challenging and enforcing that? No, for the most part, they don't want to get involved in operational decisions. But if you look at most, uh, most CMBS loans, most commercial bank, you know, standard you know, standard normal way loans against hotels, there are covenants that you have to operate in a certain way at a certain standard and you continuously operate. Uh, so you might be triggering issues there. If you took on big pieces of contract business, right? Uh, there are definitions in loan agreements that define what a material contract is and what needs lender approval and what doesn't. So some people have gone and gotten lender approval some have asked for lender approval and, and got a, we're thinking about it, but, you know, in order to get a big piece of state business, you know, and commit to the state in 24 hours or 48 hours when your lender takes a week to get back to you, some people have done what they need to do to survive. Uh, and I don't think that the lending community will be that punitive or that difficult. However, when some loans trade to, uh, to, a, new, uh, to a new lender, and then new lender kind of wanted to be a loan to own player or wanted to exert a lot of pressure on the borrower, there are a lot of additional data points that they can point to if they strictly read uh, the, the operating covenants, the financial covenants in the loan, uh, in the loan or any of the ancillary documents. And you find borrowers, you know, in some cases have not complied, right? And they did what they needed to do. They might've even tried to comply, you know, but didn't get a timely response. Fair enough. Well, uh, let me let me turn it over to Sam and I'll be right back with you in a moment. Sam. Yes, Jonathan. Uh, my, I have only one simple question. And if you can give to a owner of an asset which is totally over leveraged real estate asset and he's going to the bank, what are maybe some couple of tips that he should be considering in order to survive the, the, the storm and get some more funds if he doesn't have a, another investor to come and help him out? So the it, it, it's a, it's not a simple uh, it's a simple question. The answer is not as simple, but the part one of the answer is extremely simple. Uh, Ninety nine times out of a hundred, as a borrower, you know, with insurmountable or seemingly insurmountable challenges, the best thing you can do when you go see your lender is be organized, be prepared, have the numbers, have information, be transparent because you're living the situation all day, every day, 
And to think that the lender, right, and Kevin made this point earlier, uh, earlier when he was speaking, you know, none of the lenders out there assume that their entire loan a book, right, of hospitality loans will be challenged at the same time. Even the best performing assets, right, are challenged, right? And even if they have big pieces of contract business right now, that ends in a year. You know, and then what, right? How do they refinance? How do they reinvest CapEx? So be, uh, be transparent, uh, be thoughtful about who the lender is and what their concerns are. Uh, try to paint the right picture, uh, not too bleak and not too optimistic. If you have thoughts of a plan, lay it out. Uh, but if you come in and just say, hey, uh, I, this is underwater, I'm not putting in a dollar, I don't care, I don't, whatever. Even if the lender doesn't take action right then, they're gonna mark down, like we're not getting anywhere with this borrower. You know, when the market picks up a little bit, we're either selling the loan and someone else will deal with, you know, him or her, uh, you know, or uh, we need to start. We need to start taking whatever actions and start getting ready to exercise our remedies, uh, because as soon as as soon as the communication is happening primarily through lawyers, right, and not business people, it's going to take on a different life of its own. So I would be. I would also, uh, on, you know, with, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not giving legal advice, but I would recommend before you're going and sitting with or having detailed lender conversations, get the right legal advice. Because if you show up and say, we cannot pay our debts as they come due, you might be in default under your loan, you might be in default under your guarantees, and that could cause all sorts of other issues. You have to be careful what you say in writing and in person. And even though you know really good lawyers cost a lot of money, Right, there's a reason for that and they can keep you out of trouble so i would be very transparent uh very thoughtful about what you can say and how you say it uh but also understand uh the absolute best thing that happens for almost all lenders is they get a timely payment of interest expense and a timely return of their principal right so they don't get paid to take five years of up operating upside risk that's not their business model and in this environment very few of them you don't want anything other than like, hey, pay us off at par and, you know, or pay, you know, oh, you want to do a discount to pay off, you know, if it's 50 cents on the dollar, you know, don't talk to us. If, if you're 90 cents or more, you know, and, and you can figure out how to refinance this, like we could have a real discussion. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. That's been very, very helpful. And I'm sure from all the viewers, they will uh, probably take in notes as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> so back to you, Abit. Thank you. Uh, uh, PPP loans, uh, Jonathan, one last question, and then we'll, we'll uh, bring everybody back together. PPP monies, uh, how helpful have they been? Are there covenants in loan docs that might prevent or cause other heartaches? If I was to make use of that money, any, any thoughts on that? So same thing, without giving legal advice, Almost every existing mortgage loan agreement, whether in CMBS or otherwise, uh, has a restriction on the borrower's ability to take on more debt. So, you know, with all of the properties that we uh, program was originally announced before the regs were out and said, we want permission you know, in writing to take this on. And in most cases, uh, we got approval to do that right away under the caveat that the, uh, the PPP loan would not be secured, um, you know, would not be secured uh, and that we would covenant to follow all of the required regulations and, and procedures, right? Use the funds for the right purposes, uh, including, you know, not, not making any dividend distributions, but use them for operating expenses and use them for rent and, uh, for payroll and the like. So the PP, so anyone who took a PPP loan without getting lender approval, to my point before about tripping operating covenants, uh, likely tripped a, a financial covenant. And while a lender might not have objected, and all I don't know of, I don't know of any lenders that said outright no. I know some that tried to put some conditionality on the use of the funds. Uh, and try to extract some other concessions, but like the the concept of getting almost free money on an unsecured basis, 
uh, from a governmental program is very exciting. Now, the amount of it, you know, two and a half X, you know, in the first in the first round and three and a half X in the second round is nice, but it's a Band-Aid, not a solution. Right. So it, it, it's also one of the things that just allowed borrowers to fund operating expense shortfalls uh, in in most cases they're looking at situations where they, they didn't have money to make payroll or to make property taxes and property and casualty insurance payments or ground rent payments. This was like a nice little boost that happened to give them a few months of a few months of leeway, uh, you know, as they're as they're trying to navigate. When the PPP program first came out, uh, I don't think anyone assumed that we'd be staying, you know, we'd be we'd be you know, staying at home for, you know, 11 months to flatten the curve. There was, you know, stay at home for two weeks to flatten the curve, and then things are going to open in May, and then in June, and then in September, and then after New Year's. So, like, the, the answer is, if, if we knew the, the magnitude of the situation uh, in April of last year, uh, the PPP legislation and original program might have been you know, for nine months or 12 months instead of two and a half months uh, and might have allowed you to do almost anything with it other than dividend money out to yourself, uh, dividend money out to yourself. So it's been very helpful, but it's really a Band-Aid. And, you know, and it's what it's done is it's allowed borrowers to sort of prolong uh, the time period before they have to make a lot of very difficult decisions and from a lender perspective, it's been good. It's like someone else funded some liquidity. You know, we're, we, the further along we get, right, the closer we are to an increase in operating performance and a greater likelihood that you can start to pay debt service or can refinance the loan. Terrific. Sam, if it's okay, let's bring everybody back. But I'm going to continue my conversation with uh, Jonathan at this particular point. Jonathan, from cost-saving perspectives, most of the hotels certainly took out a ton of labor. Obviously, that is the single biggest expense uh, on income statement. Are there things that you have seen uh, with, with uh, people that you have worked with that might have been overlooked or areas that where we should focus from a cost-saving perspective? There's no real magic bullet. What happened was as soon as everyone figured out that this was more than a 60 day issue, all of a sudden every operating agreement, every lease, every contract, every you know multi-property service contract was reevaluated uh, you know, with discussions with the vendor or service provider because some of them have monthly, mon monthly minimums uh, you know, or uh, or certain pricing geared to certain levels of volume, which uh, no longer made sense. There were certain things you might you might not need, especially if the brand told you you don't need any more. Could you redo your cable contract, right? Could you redo your laundry contract, right? As as commercial laundries need more need more. So no magic bullet, no real magic bullet, but uh, really a bottoms up analysis. Instead of like where where the areas we can save, a bottoms up analysis of what can we do, and how, and you know, and to your point, the biggest the biggest of all is on the labor side, right? If we if we really go to not doing daily housekeeping in the future, right? And I I think you'll have it still at the luxury level, but upper upscale on down. Uh, you know, I I think it's going to be much more of an amenity and an opt in service that. Uh, you can pay for or get, or maybe some brands will distinguish themselves by offering it. Uh, but most of us as business travelers, you know, do not need or really care for daily housekeeping. We don't want someone barging into the room while we're on a conference call or moving our papers from one place to another. And that's not just a COVID related thing. And then similarly, you know, we've, we've trained customers to expect the daily housekeeping so they like it uh, but the reality is if if you pass that cost along to the to a leisure customer and said hey you're you're going to new york for three days we can make your beds and clean your room every day but it's going to cost you know 79 dollars a day to do that you know how about we sell you the room for 40 dollars less you know and we won't clean it or if you're here for a week we'll clean it after day three or day four right 
I think 50 to 75 percent of the people, if they were presented with that cost proposition, would say, I don't need it. Now, slightly different in a resort environment where you're with your family and there's sand in the rooms because you came in from the beach and you're on vacation. I, I see people paying for it more in vacation resort atmospheres or environments, but you know, in urban or a suburban hotel stay, you know, if you're if if you're taking your kid like for for their soccer tournament or hockey tournament and you're staying in a suburban hotel for two nights, you don't really need daily housekeeping, right? You need coffee. You need a, a bar that's open. You know, you, like you need the bar to be open later at night, not close at 10, 10 or 1030. You need it to be open till one or two in the morning. That's what you need. So that that's what we think is going to happen. And that will, you know, just managing that that labor component, right, is going to save a meaningful amount of dollars and, and push margin higher. I think that's the biggest of all and the industry should be all over it. Fabulous. And John, a question for you and Kevin, I'll, I'll come to you based on uh, what, what Jonathan just said. But John, if some of these um, uh, cutbacks or some of these amenities and services that have been sort of uh, shut down during the pandemic, if they never come back, are you ready to rework your chain scales? Because what would be the difference between a select service and uh, full service other than 20 bucks? Uh, uh, because right now, the, the, these, the differences are very narrow. If some more go away, what is the difference? So our, our chain scales are a little bit amenity driven, but very much rate driven anyway. You know, it'll be very interesting, you know, to Jonathan's point, there will be some brands who will offer you a little bit more and charge a little bit more and so i think there will always be this bifurcation you offer more you charge higher rate you're in a higher chain scale okay I, 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 the general thought what uh, has been at least in the industry as far as i can understand that the full service hotels have more amenities and more services since they're able to charge more and and they get placed in the uh, higher track, if you would. But if some of these uh, uh, select service hotels stop doing the breakfast that they have always talked about, or these uh, evening socials that they have always talked about, obviously the consumer might look for some money back. Uh, back, uh, Kevin, to you. Are lenders looking at certain EBITDA margin performance before they even? Uh, pick up the piece of paper to to talk to you. So that that's a it's a really interesting question. Uh, I, like I said I, previously, I think lenders uh, and buyers, frankly, look at 2020 and frankly 2021 as just non-recurring events. And so generally, what they're looking at is the operating performance in 2017, 2018, 2019. Uh, I think the question is, is this a viable hotel and or hotel location? Um, what are the long-term demand drivers? Um, how did they affect past performance and how will they likely affect performance in the future? So th those, are, those are the ways that lenders and investors think about an asset. From a lending perspective, it's generally a debt yield which is the NOI divided by the loan amount. Uh, so lenders are typically looking for, uh, particularly bank lenders, uh, looking for a 10 plus percent debt yield on 2019 NOI. Again, they're discounting the 2020, 2021. They're looking at 2019. That is not a hard and fast rule, particularly with the debt funds that can be, um, that can be more, um, uh, more flexible. If I said debt funds previously, I meant banks. Banks are looking at a 10% debt uh, debt yield. The debt funds, they'd like a 10, but they can generally be a bit more flexible. Uh, again, they're just thinking about it from a longer term uh, demand perspective and also thinking about it from a price per key perspective or loan per key perspective. Hey, have you seen any new covenants? And that's uh, to, to you again, Kevin. Uh, pandemic yeah. was not thought about for the longest time, at least in our lifetime, it hasn't been around. There was no playbook. 
all of a sudden it is front and center. Are you seeing some new covenants that might not have been around pre-pandemic days that are starting to show up? Are the loan docs changing in any way? Yeah, I, I'd say the pretty consistent new structural feature that we're seeing with hotel loans is lenders are generally requiring uh, 12, a 12 month debt service reserve that has to be capitalized at closing. And to the extent that there are projected operating shortfalls, uh, those shortfalls, maybe plus some cushion, are generally uh, being capitalized at closing. So there's effectively a carry reserve, which covers potential operating losses and debt service, which have to be posted at closing. In addition, uh, for some lenders, there's a bit of a belt and suspenders dynamic at play where uh, they will also require a carry guarantee meaning um, to the extent that the reserve is insufficient uh, to cover uh, potential shortfalls um, that, um, that the sponsor has to, has to guarantee, provide a, a personal guarantee um, that they would continue to cover any operating shortfalls um, and or shortfalls in the ability to pay debt service. So um, that covers you in the event that the reserves that are posted at closing are insufficient. Um, typically, that guarantee will burn off after the hotel has achieved some level of performance. Uh, the other thing is typically, again, once the, the, the carry um, uh, amounts are posted at closing, there's generally a requirement that they be uh, refreshed or uh, additional funds replenished in the reserve uh, once the reserve gets down to a certain level. So I'd say that pretty consistent, we're seeing those the required reserves posted at closing carry guarantee, not all the time, but frequently you'll see that as well. Okay, thank you. Jean, back to you. Uh, uh, we all live and die by budget, uh, and it is an arduous exercise at the best of times. Uh, we've got one years of pandemic data. Uh, how do I project? What can I expect? Because I'm sure all stakeholders, uh, including the lenders, including the owners, brands, everybody wants some sort of projections. Any thoughts on how do I, what crystal ball should I look at? Well, I think Jonathan may be easier qualified to, to say that. I think he's living that <laughs> conversation as we speak, probably. Um, you know, from our perspective, you know, the, the, the budget, a lot of people look at the budget and especially the top line in comparison to their comp set, you know, am I doing better or worse than the market or these five or six properties I chose? You know, it's never been more crucial to pick the right comp set, you know, to, to make sure that you're actually comparing yourself. Otherwise, you're chasing, you know, it's just uh, something that, that's uh, not achievable, you know. So certainly that will be the first step that I will propose is, is make sure that that's locked up correctly. Um, and then on, on the budget side, I mean, I think if I sort of paraphrase Jonathan here, this is a lot of it has to do with every single line item, you know, and saying what can we just leave out, you know, and coming back to your earlier point or your earlier question, you know, these amenities that are going away, what does that, what's the impact on the performance of the property on the chain scale uh, slot? You know, I, I'm not sure that these are going to be gone forever. Right. I think what we saw in 2010 and 11 is that the brands were saying, oh, we need to differentiate. Hey, dear owner, now do the happy hour and hey, dear owner, and now do these other five things. And there's going to be this creep. I think we've seen this movie before and I can see Kevin and Jonathan nodding here, you know, that we this is right now we're cutting maybe into the bone to the bone anyways. We're going to come out of this and suddenly we're going to see room demand and room rates going up. And then the brands and the owners are going to say, oh, well, I want to compete for the guests. I need to offer more. And we're going to see expense rise, rise back up. Uh, Jonathan, yeah. uh, would you like to add anything further to that? Because the, the general thought process is that as we come out of this pandemic, uh, the industry might actually perform 50, 100, 150 bips better than pre-pandemic days. Uh, uh, any thoughts? So, yeah, so I, I agree with everything that was said. We've always seen kind of the, that brand creep and amenity creep come back. It's natural. 
Uh, it would be, I think it would be unwise to assume that costs cut out will not come back over time. Uh, as we discussed before, I think the biggest one that could be permanent or semi-permanent or with a tweak is on the housekeeping side. But what we've done, uh, what this pandemic has done is, is it's forced operators and the brands and industry participants to rethink technology, right? The contact list check-in, the how do you deal with rooms? How do you deal with people? How do you service you know, breakfast without doing the buffet or even without having a lot of waiter service? And what this has probably done is it's probably fast forwarded our embrace of technology and the consumer embrace of technology in the hotel industry by probably five to seven years, right? So it's, it's not changed anything, but it's accelerated changes already there, like the digital check-in, right? Or control things in your room or figure out how to order your food without picking up the phone and calling someone, but order a room service or ordered from, from the restaurant that way. And the hotel industry has been notoriously slow at adopting new technologies, new and widely used technologies, partly because, you know, the brands are not the primary owners. And we we're so dispersed in terms of how many management companies, how many owners, franchisees. So you could have the, the most brilliant solution, but you need to get thousands of owners to buy into that solution, you know, at a similar point in time and get on the same platforms and programs. So I think that's that's really kind of important. And I think between the technology and between really stripping away, really stripping away the, the thought of what do we do in 2019 and 18 and doing a bottoms up analysis of, you know, what are our operating expenses? What are our contracts? What do we really need? How can we negotiate better or smarter? Um, you know, we will end up with some savings. We do come through each down cycle with a, a somewhat better more efficient operating margin structure and model. And I think that will be the case as well, uh, but certainly not everything will be stripped out. And I'll, I'll make one quick comment on the budget review process we did. So as I mentioned before, you know, we went and, and, and had teams look at every single contract, right, bottoms up. But when we went to the budget meetings and did the, did the Zoom calls and the WebEx meetings and the Teams meetings, and had the teams, and we went through about 30 budgets, right, through stuff that we asset manage and, and they're doing restructuring projects and consulting on. Uh, we spent the majority of the time not going line by line through the budgets. That was already done and an ongoing process. We spent the majority of our time in the budget reviews, uh, which were in some cases fairly extensive, thinking through the guerrilla marketing strategies. How will we pivot to get these kinds of business what will we empower our employees to do? Because the vast majority of the, uh, of the sales incentive plans were written at a different time. They were based on a certain RevPAR index and a certain minimum percent of budget. And we were like, how, how do we incent our salespeople? Forget about last year's policy. Forget about December's policy. Like we, we need, you know, we need good productive salespeople to do the right things. We need a policy to incentivize our chief engineer and the engineering team who's working harder than ever before because you know we we cut you know 40 percent of their staff and they're they're helping in the kitchen and they're helping in the ballroom and they're you know and they're maintaining the building how do we incent that so we spend a lot of time on employee related activities and incentives who would be empowered to do certain types of out marketing and what could we do in the local communities knowing that a lot of that was not going to generate immediate business but being a good corporate citizen and local citizen knowing that the markets will be back whether it's in a year two years or three years and we want to be there as as a real player fantastic well a fabulous conversation sam i know we have approached the end uh, but uh, any any thoughts from you any questions that you would like to add at this point before we close? I think you covered it all, Abid. Fabulous. Well, look, uh, typically our tradition on this uh, uh, broadcast is that we always end on feel-good stories. But unfortunately, uh, last week, the biggest news in the industry was the unexpected passing of Arnie Sorensen, CEO of 
Marriott hotels and resorts. Uh, undoubtedly, the industry has lost an icon and in a very unexpected time. But uh, our uh, best wishes and condolences to the Sorensen family and Marriott family together. Jonathan, uh, uh, great to have you with us. Thank you for taking the time. Kevin Davis and John Freitag, uh, thanks for being at Hospitality Talks. Thanks for all your input. Over to you, Sam. Yeah, I'd like to thank uh, all, uh, we have several uh, live viewers. I'd like to thank you very much for staying on to our, our, our show and also all the replay viewers. I really appreciate, appreciate that you have uh, watched this show. And uh, uh, for the replay viewers, you will see here another video you should uh, look at where we have some other dis interesting discussions. So uh, just please look at our next episodes. We will be, uh, we'll be live again on LinkedIn, on Facebook, Hospitality Talks group page and our Hospitality Talks uh, YouTube channel. So thank you very much, all the, the panelists and uh, all the best and stay safe. Thank, thank you. you.